Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Um, nursing my cold. Slowly getting better. Slowly getting better. Um, but uh, there'll be a few coughs tonight, and I don't have my cough button. Because nope. my podcasting room is... Uh, been taken over as a sick room by my wife, who also has this wretched cold. Oh. All righty. Bruce, the Oilers won tonight, 7-2 preseason over the Calgary Flames AHL version. It's kind of weirdly late to be seeing an AHL version of an NHL team in the pre- pre- preseason. Are, are they at it like a different part of their preseason in Calgary where they have like four games left or something because you'd think that you'd want to get the NHL roster going at some point but they, um, they used up their NHL roster games in that 10 nothing win over Vancouver back in the first preseason game statement they, game this is the ga- they the lineup they meant to use that night was the one they sent to Edmonton tonight I think because that did not look much like the Calgary Flames and right from top to bottom, there was not very many sort of standout guys that you would say, oh, yeah, that guy's a full-time flame, you know. It's a pretty marginal team they set up. And they played, they hung around for about half the game. And then once Edmonton started to pour it on in the second period of it, they had no answer. And the shots went from 17-12 Calgary midway through the game to wind up 43-20 for Edmonton, which means 31-3 the rest of the way, including 18-2 in the third period officially. So it was a pretty uh, tilted sheet of ice (coughs) in this game. And it was uh, tilted in Edmonton's favor because they had way better players. And so because of that, it's almost meaningless, you know, like what what can you even take away from a game like that? that? Connor Brown is good against AHL players. Well, you know, that doesn't really surprise me, David. No. <laughs> so yeah, you, wind, you wind up having all these games, but how often are, are they really a, 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 a test, like an even test? The home team is typically way more stacked than the visiting team. And everybody goes home happy, of course, well, except for Calgary fans when Edmonton's C team beats them in overtime in Calgary. But, uh, you know, but it's it's really... You know, it's a, it's got the trappings of an NHL game, but that's all. It's ridiculous how many preseason games there are. No, they, they've got to do. They got to cut it in half. Mm-hmm. You know, this is just no. it's, it's no. a it's become a farce. Of mm-hmm. uh, the team sitting out their players and playing their minor league players, it's just a farce. And you wouldn't want to see them play the regular players though, like endless preseason games where they're going to get hurt. It's uh, it's 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 a way to make money. Is what they're doing, and uh, but eighteen thousand really, in the fan stands tonight, David. Really tedious, but for them it's the money. So, and for the players it's the money too. To be, it's the whole shooting match of them mm-hmm. wanted to make some money. I can't blame oh. people for that, but from the, from the fan experience, it's a, it's a joke at this mm-hmm. point. Well, what, one takeaway I had from this game was that uh, Edmonton scored seven goals. And none of the goal scorers even smiled. Right? <laughs> they just turned it a little fist bump, skated off to the bench, and it's just, you know. Not even Lane like, Peterson? I don't oh, know. It's just like scoring a basket in a basketball game, you know. Uh-huh. Scores 124 to 111, you know, and you don't celebrate every every one, every one score. Well, it seemed like <laughs> that. It was just, you yeah. know, ho-hum and... Uh, other and it's yeah yeah I mean <laughs> and I mean it's on one sense it's very professional of them and on the other sense you're saying you're just crying for the games to start and where they you know they start adding that that emotion and fire into the game like this was you know all more about just you know playing it out and hoping not to get hurt and uh, uh, you know working on systems and getting ready to go and. Uh, a few guys battling for a job, and that, that part's interesting. But uh, the hockey itself, I mean, this was not really a competitive match. No. Bruce, we will do our two good things, two bad things, and two roster decisions podcast tonight. 
Okay. What's your good thing? Well, because we're going to talk about the roster decisions later, uh, and I know who we're going to be talking about, so I'm going to select uh, uh, Connor Brown as my good thing. It was just nice to see him, uh, A, connect for a couple of goals, his first two as a uh, Edmonton Oiler, and, you know, just cleaning up uh, delicious setups from Connor McDavid. He had two, he easily could have had two more in the in the third period. Uh, but it was way more than that. I really liked his defensive work in the defensive zone. And one of those plays actually resulted in an Edmonton goal where it was his his work and ability to uh, deflect a pass by Calgary onto the stick of Evander Kane that uh, resulted in the breakaway for Lane Peterson. And everybody saw Kane's pass and Peterson's fine shot. Um, but if you roll the tape back a little bit, that guy, that right shot that was over on the left wing boards that was disrupting Calgary, that started the, you know, caused the change of possession, that was Connor Brown. And that's the kind of play, you, especially in Edmonton's top six with all the sort of high octane offense that they play. To have uh, another forward in there who's, uh, by all reputation and by what I've seen by eye so far, a very strong defensive presence. And he also, you know, he's a little bit of an opportunist of a player, which is also what you like to see, especially if you're going to be stapled to uh, McDavid, as he has been to this point. He's going to get his chances. We know this. Yeah, he scored on a nice shot. Mm-hmm. He and he, so he's coming off a knee injury. Looks fast though. Looks like he's mm-hmm. fully recovered. Um, people have said he looks like Hyman. He does. He does look a lot like Hyman. Kind of like Hyman, maybe. You know, he's kind of hunched over a little bit more, like more like John Tanelli. Um, that hunched over style going in there, mm-hmm. um, fighting for the puck. But he is a hard working player. He's a mm-hmm. fast player. He's a smart player. Defensive, defensively conscientious. What is not to like with Connor Brown? I mean, he just seems to be everything that has been advertised and more. Mm-hmm. And this is really good news for the Edmonton Oilers. I mean, you're always worried with a player with knee surgery that they're going to suddenly be past it. But the knee surgery is not what it was, Bruce, when we were growing up watching the NHL. It's a lot better now. It's a lot less disruptive for players. And uh, he is an awfully fine hockey player. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how much he scores this year. What's your prediction? Uh, I'll go with, uh, I'm going to say he's going to score (coughs) uh, career high 25 goals. And likely a similar number or more assists than that. So I'll put Pegum north of 50 points. So right. he's able to play somewhere close to the full slate. Yeah, because he's not going to get power play time. So nope. if you get like 55 even strength points in a season, yeah. that's a pretty good season. Yeah, you're you're right about the power play point. So maybe I'm a little bit uh, overzealous there. But I do think he's going to score. And he's going to yeah. you know, be a difference maker at even strength for sure. I, I'd like to see him get at least 20 even strength goals. And I think that's, uh, I think yeah, that's his career, career high is about 20. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can see that coming. And he'll score a shorty or two or three along the way, too. You watch. <clears throat> All right, uh, Bruce, my um, good thing will be the two young defensemen, um, Philip Broberg and Ben Gleason. Um, I think, you know, I missed the first, first few preseason games that had people all worried about Broberg. But um, since I've seen him play, Bruce, he's just such a fundamentally sound player. His stick is is in great position, most plays, um, and he he stops a lot of shots and passes that way and prevents them from happening in the first place. He um, he's a tremendous skater, fundamentally sound defensive hockey player. You know, if your idea of a defenseman is, um, I don't know, Scott Stevens or Nicholas Cronwall, he he's not that guy. He's he, he I think he he's going to infuriate people who want the big Bobby Clobber on defense, mm-hmm. and he plays just a really finesse defensive game. He gets the puck and he moves it fast. Um, it's just a very quiet game, a quiet, mm-hmm. fundamentally sound game. 
I, I think if there was a criticism, you know, he should be encouraged to use his attacking skills more. And, you know, we saw it the other night with him making Two it games in a row. <clears throat> real backhand pass. Yeah, he rushed up the ice in the other game and set up, uh, was it Lavoie? Lavoie. Mm-hmm. For his goal. And then he set up Holloway, was it? No, Borgo for yeah. that one timer against mm-hmm. uh, Seattle. Tonight, it was just another quiet, effective game. He and Cece looked really strong together, I thought. They didn't give up hardly anything. Um, uh, unlike Bouchard and Nurse, who were on for both goals against, which we'll get to in a second. Um, he's just a classy um, stay-at-home defenseman type. And um, I, I think he's earned a spot now on the roster for opening for opening day. We'll talk about that in a bit. Right, <coughs> yeah, yeah. He he uh, uh, he's really effective at closing gaps, eh? Yeah. And he does it so quickly. You almost, you know, you got to be paying attention because you know he makes it look so easy. And you know, it looks like the other team's got the puck, and all of a sudden they don't have it anymore because that gap got closed and the puck got stripped, and either he's you know chipped it over somewhere. You know, loose puck or got into a teammate somehow, and and uh, uh, he's he's super um, uh, just quick on his on his feet, and he's so as I like to say, the two hundred hockey men like to say he's long. He is long, he's, eh? He's, he's like long. Six he's long, and then with when he reaches out, he's more like twelve foot eight. You know, he really yeah. is like got a. Uh, so he can close those gaps real fast. And he's also lithe and lean. And so, you know, he's uh, he's still a 22-year-old kid, you know. I, I get a little tired of all the abuse I'm reading of this guy. You know, he's still on his entry-level contract. He's still a work in progress. He's a, uh, at a good price for, uh, you know, bottom-pairing defenseman. And if he works out to be more than that, it's a great price. So... You know, they can't all, they're not all going to be Nick Lidstrom out there, folks. You need no. you need third line, pairing defensemen. You need fourth line forwards, and some of them make, uh, you know, when they're when they're at the still in the six figure range, um, expectations should be set accordingly. I mean, he's he's a young player; he's improving. We don't know what the ceiling is going to be, nor when he's going to get there. But uh, let's enjoy him as he rises up the ranks. You know, rather than constantly, some some folks constantly on, still whining or re-legislation, re-legislating, re-litigating the 2019 draft. Well, that's history. And its result is Philip Broberg is an oiler. And as an oiler fan, I'm rooting for him like I root for all mm-hmm. the others. I don't know why that's so hard. <laughs> well, some fans have a recurring hallucination that they're smarter than Ken Holland and um, should be running the team. And they're they tend to be the biggest critics of players like this because they feel, you know, they should have been someone else on the team. And if they had been GM, there would have been someone else on the team. Mm -hmm. Um, The other guy I want to talk about is Ben Gleason, who Mm -hmm. is, um, I think he's 24, 25. Uh, Is he ever a smart hockey player? He just makes all the right plays. He he has been, you know, to, to put him in some context, he has been fairly high event Mm -hmm. in the playoffs. In, excuse me, in the preseason. <clears throat> He's had his fair share of mistakes and plays that haven't gone his way, but more, far more go his way. And it's because he's smart with the puck. He's smart reading the play. He's smart defensively. He made a great stop on a on near goal against, I think, when the game was tied um, in this game uh, where Stuart Skinner got beat on a deke and the player threw the puck back into the middle. And uh, Gleason was there to tuck it under Skinner with this kind of sprawling stick play. He uh, he he reminds me of a player, f- a, a little bit at least, um, Norman McIver, who was a smaller, mm-hmm. really super smart hockey player. Was he ever? He's not quite as good with the puck as Mc- he's not as good as the puck with as McIver was, but he's uh, at least as good defensively. And McIver was okay defensively. He teamed up with Dave Manson actually. He did on, on, on a the, very uh, fine pairing. Yeah. Gleason, Bruce, the owners have really solid defensive depth. It's suddenly occurred to me. I mean, between Gleason and uh, Phil Kemp, who has acquitted himself well in the preseason, um, Cam Deneen, Marcus Niemelainen, um, 
they've got some guys in the HL if there's <coughs> excuse me, if there's some injuries, the orders are gonna be uh, they're gonna be covered. They got some guys who can come up and play. And um it's gotten to the point where I'm now a little bit worried if Gleason sent down that the, uh, some other team's going to snap him up off the waiver wire because he looks like an NHL defenseman. He looks like at least as good as a lot of the players I'm seeing on the other teams. Um, but uh, I don't think he would be snapped up, but he is a good find for the Oilers. What do you think of him? Yeah, I like kind of like your comp of, uh, of Norm McIver. Um like certainly that style of of player that you know he's he's more about finesse and and thinking the game and and moving the puck quickly when he gets it and he has made one or two you know really strong defensive plays at uh, key moments like that one you described tonight which uh, I think the flame was likely to come around and just tap it in until uh, he came through behind Skinner to make that clearance. And, uh, I'm confident that he's, you know, he's a strong defenseman in the AHL, that he's going to be on the call-up list. But, again, we'll talk about this in a bit. I think he's, a, a, you know, a, a tweener is sort of the, the uh, uh, would even be a step up for him at this point compared to how relatively little he's played in the NHL. But, Four uh, games, I think. Yeah, 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 that's not very much, is it? But uh, I could never quite get uh, why Edmonton let Norm McIver go. I guess they lost him in the waiver. <laughs> they lost him in the waiver draft. It's nuts. I never could understand why Isn't they. Isn't it funny? Because he was, yeah, he and he and Manson were a very strong pairing, and he was, you know, he was <clears> the, <throat> the the uh, the smaller, uh, uh, you know, more agile guy. Uh, yeah. 5'11", 180 pounds, I'm just looking it up. And he made Manson better. And Manson was able to concentrate more on, you know, being big Bobby Clobber, as you say, uh, with that big slapper of his Well, you had to get the puck on his stick. And McIver was pretty good at that. And it was just one of those ones where when they did lose him, the official dialogue seemed to be, well, you know, when you look at McIver out there and he's got trying to handle Bob Probert at the edge of the crease, he just can't do the job. And I'm saying, I'm looking around the NHL and I'm looking for all the D-men that are doing the job against Bob Probert. And I'm not seeing very many of them. You know, don't pick out the one thing that you think the guy can't handle and just write him off because of that. Ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> That's my bad thing. I don't have much bad to say about this game, so... The way the Oilers hosed Norm McIver 30 years ago, that's my bad thing. <laughs> Bruce, you got to come up with a better bad thing than that. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's not, pretty, that's, that will not that's a good it. bad thing. That's, that's a good bad no, thing. No, it is not. A good, <laughs> that's too long ago. Oh, okay. You have to think hard. Okay, my bad thing is, um, I think it was the second goal against. Uh-huh. The yep. first one was Zadorov, right? Yeah, so the second that. one is, okay, the Oilers are playing a zone. Mm-hmm. The whole idea of the zone is you don't have two defensemen behind the net anymore. It doesn't happen. You, you're, you're supposed to, you know, one guy can go battle back there. The other guy's in front of the net. So what happens? Bouchard's behind the net and Darnell Nurse can help himself. He can't help himself. You know, after wandering out of, you know, out of position so many times last year, what does he do? He wanders behind the net. They pass it out front and score. And... It's the second time in the preseason where Nurse, the other time he was in front of the net and he forgot to take it, the stick of his man who deflected it in. You know, it's his, it is a zone. You have one job, cover the front of the freaking net. And, um, you know, um, Nurse is a veteran player. He, he has just got to play his position, play the zone. It works. You know, the beauty of the zone is it kind of, it takes all of the randomness of hockey, you know, the pucks bouncing, bouncing here and there and everywhere. But it's when it's bouncing in front of the net that it causes the most damage. So the idea of the zone yeah. is you just have players standing there ready to bat it out of the way or cover people who are there. So all it's about. It's just a real simple idea. They're not going to score from the corner. You don't have to go there, actually. You can. They can do what they want in the corner. And... Um, you're going to be all right because they score all their goals from in front of the net. So you, you stay, you keep guys mm -hmm. in front of the net. That's your zone. 
and you bat the puck away when it comes there, you don't go wandering behind the net anymore. And Nurse has just got to get through this through his head to cover the guys in front of the net and and stay in position, hold his position. And I know, so it's just preseason game. But I was nonetheless a little bit frustrated after watching Nurse wander, you know, so much last year under this different system, which encouraged aggressiveness. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, he's got to learn it. <clears throat> uh, well, I'm, I'm going to put a silver lining on your bad thing, and that's this. It happened in the preseason. Indeed. And this is the exact time where they're supposed to be learning the new systems. And now not, that's not much evidence that it's being learned, but it's a good time to be learning and, you know, making the mistakes and having to face the uh, the video coach tomorrow with, uh, you know, this is what happened on that. I mean, I looked at it and I thought, geez, there's like three Oilers behind the net because one of the forwards went in there as well. And then the Fall other two, away. the two wingers were on the boards and the whole slot from basically the goal crease all the way out to as far as he wanted to go. I mean, back to the other goalie. It was just clean ice. And some Calgary guy wanders in there and wraps it home because he's got nobody even att- even close to him. So I was a little sour at that moment at the at Me the too. quintet. But I think you're probably right in terms of the, the breakdown was uh, was uh, uh, most specific to that one player over the others. Okay, Bruce, have you thought of a bad thing? Uh, can I list the Calgary Flames roster tonight? Hunt, how about, Sharon how about Govich, s- Dubé, Hanzek, Klapka, Zeri, Ruzichka, Dur, Chiona, Chiona, Pospisil. I mean, that's a great name from another generation. Pedersen, Schwint. And on defense, Zadorov, Gilbert or Gilbert, I'm not sure. De Simeone, Poirier, Otterley, Solovyov. I mean, what is that? There's barely, I mean, there's a few second and third pairs. Who's the best player on the team tonight? Zadorov, maybe? Have they sent no players to the AHL yet? Like, it's like, what are they doing? <laughs> I'm not like, sure. How many more so, exhibition games do they have? Like, mm-hmm. maybe they're just waiting for all that. of these Tomorrow guys. Tomorrow they have an exodus. Yeah, there's going to the be like 16 cuts yesterday, tomorrow morning. Yeah. And then on whoever they got left on the preseason slate, we'll see the actual flames. And, you know, obviously we saw a few NHOs. They had to dress some sort of seven guys, but. With NHL experience, but Jordan Osterley, for instance, he qualifies for that because he's got games over the years. Anyway, uh, and and to me, that just sort of sours the, 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 the enjoyment of the game is that, you know, it was more like a, more like a, uh, a practice and, uh, you know, like Calgary just didn't really put up a whole lot of, of, uh, Opposition. Here's the stats: 44-20 shots, 66.7% Edmonton on the faceoff dot. So they literally won two thirds of the faceoffs, and six pims for Edmonton, 14 for Calgary because they couldn't handle Edmonton. They kept tripping and interfering with them, and you know it was just a a very uh, one-sided game that got more so as, as it went along. So to me, that is a bad thing, and that it's you know it's it's. The orders are trying their new lines, but it's not a real test against a real competition. And that's just a general observation slash complaint, if not grievance, that I hold against the NHL for many years. All right, that's a bad <laughs> that was a good bad thing. <laughs> Since Norm McIver's time, if not before. <laughs> <laughs> to bring it around town. All right. Um Bruce, um, two roster decisions for the Oilers. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe just one. Um, they, they've got to pick their seventh D. And, mm-hmm. I, and I think it's going to be DeHarnay. Um, mm-hmm. I think he would be taken on waivers if they waive Vinny DeHarnay. I think he would be. And um, probably. I'm and, not sure they have to. What? Because... He just signed uh, not that long ago, but I'm not quite sure of his status on that. But I don't think they would waive him because um, no. he, you know, anyway, he's because uh, he's only played under an NHL contract for a year and a half. So 
And I know even the orders themselves got messed up on that uh, yesterday when they sent sent out James Hamblin. Originally, they declared that they'd waived him, and it turned out they didn't have to waive him because he, you know, he's still uh, new enough on his on his contract that they can freely move him back and forth for a bit. So, and I'm less sure about Deharnay just because of his advanced age. There may be a thing when you turn 27, you know, you're you're flat out NHL pro, and that, that may be what overrides it. But uh, anyway, I don't think they'd wait <coughs> to Harney, and I don't think they want to. I think they want him around, yeah. and I think they, you know, there's many things to like about the ga- his game, and some of them are that he's different from most of the other defensemen on the team. And if you're looking for a balanced crew of defensemen, you know, he's. Uh, uh, he he brings some things that, that the other guys don't. And again, you're talking about a six seven defenseman making, you know, NHL minimum. Uh, and but and Ekholm still hasn't played. And Kulak missed the game he was supposed to play in. And yeah, so maybe he's, he's banged sort of, up. He's banged so maybe up sure. maybe there's a couple of injuries. So maybe um, maybe Gleason and DeHarnay are both on the roster. Um, well, here's the problem with that. Uh, there's no room like they got room for 21 guys on the roster and if somebody's injured uh now they've got 20 and they got no no replacements the only way that they can create salary space is if someone is ltir'd if he's just short-term injured they're paying him and he's staying on the payroll so an you know, ltir is 20 days is that it it's, it's uh 24 days or 10 games Wow. Yeah. So, you know, the guy be out till November. So let's say, for instance, Kulak is banged up and they decide they can't start the season with him and and Ekholm isn't quite ready yet. Well, they obviously want to have Ekholm ready to go. And the choice would be, well, we want to go a man short or do we want to ice Brett Kulak for uh, three weeks? In which case, now there is a little bit of cap room that maybe they can bring in two guys but they don't have Brett Kulak. So, you know, there's just not much flexibility for injuries injuries of the short-term type. Wow. So, yeah. All right. Um, <clears throat> there is a roster decision involving the goalies. And um, at this point, Stuart Skinner has not looked sharp in the preseason. He led in, I thought, an iffy goal tonight. Um, Zadorov shot was from outside, and he should have had that. I mean, Bouchard oh, gave up too much gap, but he he let him walk right in, and Kane let him walk right in. And but um, the goalie should have had that. And Campbell has looked fantastic. Campbell's looked better than he looked all of last year. He's looked yeah. steadier in the nets. Mm-hmm. Um, he's looked um, the the, reba- the ugly rebounds haven't been there. And um, one of the thoughts that I had, the zone might have been helping him a bit because. I think we're seeing fewer um, cross-seam kind of passes. Fewer of the worst mm-hmm. kind of cross-seam, wide-open guys shooting the puck on net. The you know the the fifty percent shots. <laughs> the, there's there's yeah. been some great A shots from the zone, but they tend to they come right in at you. The, the shots tend to be straight on, and they can be difficult so far. But they they do seem to cut out those those really, really difficult shots that are, you know, the puck zinging across the, the crease to a guy who's the danger man creeping into the play, gets the puck, he's wide open, and he fires away. And um, those shots are difficult for any goalie. They are really super difficult for Campbell last year, who wasn't moving very well in the night, who wasn't very confident. He's looking great. And um, if he comes in and, and uh, has a good game in the next game, he'll start in the first game of the season, I think, because he's looked better than Skinner and, um, I mean, Skinner wasn't great in the playoffs, and um, based on that, though, I, I just, you know, Woodcroft has said it's open, so if it's open, it's open, and Campbell's up playing him right now. Yeah, I anticipate the two of them will get the two first two games, one each, Yeah, <clears throat> both against Vancouver, so whoever plays first gets the season opener, and then whoever plays second gets the home opener, doesn't and really they each get a chance. Yeah, it doesn't... That doesn't much matter. Last year, Campbell started the first two games, and he got pulled 10 minutes into the second game after giving in four goals to Calgary, and Skinner came and slammed the door, and already the controversy was on, like two games into the season. Yeah. But 
I'm seeing a little less, I think, controversy now. But uh, as you say, Skinner's a bit on the back foot. And Campbell, you know, since April 1st, David, I talked about this to uh, Low Tide on the radio today. Since April 1st, he's played in eight games. The la- two games at the end of the regular season, full games. Four part playoff games that added up to two full games, about 120 minutes. And now two full preseason games. And over those eight games, it's sort of 360 minutes of playing time. He's faced 183 shots and let in five goals, five goals, and like one or zero. And all eight of those appearances, he's never been beaten more than once. And though it's apples and oranges and pineapples of the three classes of games, you know, playing different quality of opponents under different circumstances. And the playoffs, when he did come in, it tended to be when Edmonton was behind and the other team was protecting the lead and not really pushing it. But still, he faced 51 shots and he stopped 49 of them. That's pretty good. So so he's um, uh, he's started to show the signs of turning around and in, in, in eight, right towards the end of the season. And the playoffs, he was good, but never sort of earned the faith to ever get a start, which in retrospect, and even at the time, I said in game six against Vegas, it was a mistake. Uh, but uh, he's uh, now backed that up with a really solid showing in his uh, first couple of preseason games. He got a huge lucky break in Calgary when uh, time ran out just as he let, did let in a bad goal that didn't count because the clock ended. That would have been a real bad ending to what had been a very good game for him. Uh, but uh, and he's getting some bounces. No goal. He runs a 9.73 save percentage for long without being a little lucky. But the point is that that uh, he's been pretty good for a while. In turn, even if you you know there's several months off in there, but uh, uh, eight appearances is uh, you know that's a uh, a fair little chunk of games with uh, with good results, so that's very very encouraging. And I I think his demeanor and his, you know he he seems the confidence seems to be growing, and that's good to see because uh, Oilers he's under contract for four more years. He needs to be good. He does, <laughs> he does. Uh, Bruce, the other roster decision is the um, final forward spot. Uh, I thought Rafael Lavoie had some good moments in tonight's game. He muscled right, the puck up too. from behind the net and threw it on net on one play and um, had another good shot from the outside. Yeah, he's he's an interesting player. Like, he's not a high-energy player. He's not a hitter, but he can make plays. And they they try and Yanmark at center, which is interesting. He's a t- t- terrible career face-off man, Matthias Yanmark, um, somewhere around 40%. He had his career high actually last year with the Oilers. He didn't take many face-offs, but he had like 44%. But Matthias Janmark is a very, very smart defensive hockey player. He could play center defensively and get the job done. I, I have no doubt about that. And um, if that's the primary function of the fourth line center, it's kill penalties, um, play def- solid defensive hockey, and... Um, provide some energy. Well, that that's Matthias Janmark. You know, you'd like to throw in win face-offs. Yeah. Well, he, he's that's not. That's not Matthias Janmark. That's not him. So there's going to be one thing there. <clears throat> but as a placeholder, mm-hmm. um, until something better comes up, that could work for a while. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you want to try out Raphael Lavoie and see how he does in the Klim mm-hmm. costume role. I mean, I think um, Ernay's looked, or Adam Ernay has looked okay. Mm-hmm. Um, he's played with some energy and he's had some decent results, but and and Lane Peterson scored a nice goal tonight. He did nice snipe. But I think I like Lavoie the best of all of them at yep. this point. Me too. So, what's your thought, Bruce? Yeah, Lavoie got he got a goal tonight on a uh, nice finish from him tight <laughs> tight to the net. He was he was in the spot and he took the pass and just got it up quickly and up and over the the glove of Dan Vladar and. Uh, Calgary's net for the uh, I think it was the last goal of the game so it didn't, you know, I mean this wasn't a competitive game but you're looking for signs and uh, that's one, twice now he's gotten loose right in front of the other guy's net both times he put the puck in it which yeah, is he did. very nice I mean, how many times would Warren Fogel need to get loose in front of the other times net to score twice, you know 10, <laughs> 15 
you know, I mean, he gets his chances, but they, they're hard to bury. Whereas Lavoie has the the bearing of a goal scorer. That's uh, you know, he's used to doing that. And uh, tonight he had. Uh, uh, I thought he had a pretty good game in other areas. I thought he was uh, pretty decent defensively. He was aggressive. He took the puck hard to the net two or three times and, and mustered, you know, an angle shot from in tight where, you know, he created some issues uh, for a goalie to deal with. And he had in this game three hits and four shots in just under 13 minutes. I mean, he was involved in the, in the, uh, uh, <clears throat> in, in both aspects of the, you know, physicality, but also, bringing the offense here's a funny not funny stat from tonight's game david here are the oilers that had multiple hits in this game uh there's a handful of them including lane peterson two adam ernie three Raphael lavoie three uh fa afo two no evander kane two he's that's the one guy that's sort of experienced but he hits just for old Lang Syne. and on defense, Ben Gleason with two. Everybody fighting for a job was once taking the hits tonight, <coughs> and all the other guys were like zero or one, right? So, and it's, it's just a little hint about how the preseason game isn't a level playing field. Even within a team, you have different motivations. Some guys are just trying to work their way in shape and not get hurt, and other guys are playing their ass off, just trying to make a spot on the team or make an impression that they might get called up later. And so they're playing, they're putting more on the line, uh, the guys that are initiating the contact. And to me, that just kind of jumped off the page here. Look at that, all the hitters are the guys that are right on the fringes of the roster, go figure. So you think, <coughs> excuse me, Lavoie, Bruce? I do. Lavoie. I, I do. I think, I mean, you look at Lane Peterson, uh, and he's a guy who's cleared waivers before, and when they put him on the waiver wire, he's going to yeah. clear waivers again. Yeah, yeah. And if you put Raphael Lavoie on the waiver wire, well, he might clear, because a lot of guys do slip through this time of year, and uh, then again, he might not, and it only takes one. It only takes one Montreal or Ottawa Chicago out there to say, look at that, 64, six foot four, and he scored 25 goals last year. You know, Anaheim. and I, I, I saw, yeah, yeah, I, I saw enough tonight, especially of uh, of him imposing his, you know, his giant size uh, on, you know, different parts of the ice, and also delivering offensively with some good chances and a goal. So uh, that's the guy I don't want to take a chance on. I'll, I'll wave. I'll be sh- frankly shocked where Lane Peterson to get claimed on because every team has got a Lane Peterson. And I mean, sure, every team's got a Raphael Lavoie too, but we don't really know what he is yet. And I think it's we kind of got Lane Peterson surrounded with his 71 NHL games, four goals and seven assists. You know, he's probably not going to move the needle that much, right hand shot center or not. Whereas Raphael Lavoie, big right shot winger with the wicked shot and the huge size and, you know, considerably younger than Lane Peterson, you got to see what you got. So, you know, he's the first guy to, I think, sort of, you give him the first shot. And if he fails, then, you know, I mean, they had the same decision a couple of years ago when they sent down, this time, Ryan McLeod and kept up Tyler Benson and also Brennan Perlini. Uh, Perlini had a really hot preseason. Uh, uh, Benson, not so much. But both those guys were eligible for waivers, and McLeod wasn't, so they kind of took the easier, easy way out. Now, this time, I, they won't be doing that to Dylan Holloway because he's just been too good. He's, he's I think, completely cleared. So at one point, I thought, you know, maybe if he has a poor preseason, they send him down for a week or two while they give other guys a look. But he's in there. But I think... Uh, uh, Peterson's on the outside looking in, and Ernie, uh, he hasn't got a contract yet, and I'm not sure that he gets one. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure either. Yeah, I could give him one, send him down, and have him as you know call up insurance, and that's possible. But I don't see him as flat out making the team over uh, Rafa Lavoie. And this is you know Adam Ernie's got 350 games in the NHL. He's not you know it's a player, but he to, by stat and to my limited eye, he's a player that's probably peaked about two years ago. Yeah. 
I think Ken Holland's kind of old school. He doesn't like to waste things. He's mm-hmm. kind of a waste, not want, not kind of guy. And um, Depre- depression era. <clears throat> mm-hmm. That's right, Bruce. I don't think he's from that. <laughs> he's not born then, but you know, he was, his parents were, and he was probably shaped mm-hmm. by that. And he, yeah, he's going to give. They're going to see what they have in Raphael Lebois, I think, right now. And yeah, uh, I agree. I agree. Yeah. That's uh, he's first on the list, and I mean, last on the list is you get a guy for 4C at the deadline, just like they yeah. did last year with uh, Bukestad. Yeah. And, you know, you build up some calf space and you look around the league and you see who might be selling and you see which player has a, checks the most boxes of what you're looking for. I mean, Nick Bukestad, right shot center, check. Good on face-offs, check. Gigantic, check. You know, can kill penalties, check. And by the time they went through all that, and thought, oh, and they can retain half his salary, check. And and you can make a pretty good deal on the short-term rental market. But in the meantime, you have sort of a long-term... Like, I'm not worried that the 12th forward is the difference between owners making or missing the playoffs. Let's put it that way. So you got a little room to experiment. It's not like you need to have your maximum Stanley Cup roster on October 11th or else, right? You're building the team, and part of that build is looking at what you got. And sometimes the, the contract situation forces the issue, like it, it will with Lavoie, in that they just can't send him down without you know without now having to clear that waiver point so that's a, that's a real inflection point on any young player's career <clears throat> so i heard brian lawton on oilers now and he was saying he doesn't like the idea of moving to the zone he thinks the oilers did well on defense last year mm-hmm. um and he, yeah i was shocked because lawton usually strikes me as like one of the smartest guys in the room but i honestly don't take that as a smart position I mean, Bruce, they almost allowed four goals a game in the playoffs to Vegas. In no universe is that acceptable. It's not even close. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they were middle of the pack defensively all year. And in the playoffs, they fell apart against Vegas defensively. It was a, it was a disaster. Um, so mm-hmm. I wanted to... Uh, my theory is that, like, if you're a kind of a Dave Tippett loyalist... You like the style of defense that Tippett coached and that Woodcroft inherited and continued to coach. You're kind of loyal. You might have a certain loyalty to that. Just one thought, um, because I don't, I don't get it. Like I know some people don't like the zone, um, but from what I'm seeing so far, it's it's settled things down considerably for the Oilers. Even in these preseason games, I know they're playing not really great teams. Um, right now are, are not full, you know, NHL lineup rosters, but there's been a way less chaos in front of the Oilers net than there was um, in pre- previous preseasons. We'll see if it carries over the regular season. I think it will. It should. Um, if they if they play the zone well and they, mm-hmm. if they play disciplined, it, it will it will bring considerably less chaos in front of the Oilers net. But um, what what do you take of Lawton's comment? How are Oh, I wonder how much of the Vegas series he watched. I mean, Vegas and some of their veteran forwards, they really exposed that. I mean, remember Jonathan March so not only scoring yeah. a hat trick, but also the comment that he made of knowing just beat that him to the net. just beat him to the net and you're going to find the puck once in a while. Yeah. And he did. And he scored and they won, you know. So from an Oilers perspective, that has to be, you'd like to think the the coaching staff and the team, really, the players themselves are thinking, well, that's not working the way we thought. Maybe we better uh, uh, try a different approach. And there's nothing saying it's forever, but, you know, let's try a new system and, and we can mix in more than one. And I think that, in fact, is the idea right from the start, that they want to have different ways to play the game, that they might more likely go into the zone or even the trap, you know, with a lead halfway through the third period. And you see lots of teams do this. Well, you got to have the sort of fundamentals down. So playing sort of primarily one system for a while will, will help them cement the, you know, the positional play on the uh, 1-1-3 or 1-3-1, however they decide to go with it. <clears throat> and, you know, and it's dictated by... Uh, Things like score of the game, whether you're trailing or leading or tied, uh, the um, 
uh, state of your team, who's go, who's going, who's not going, who's out of the lineup, uh, whether you played last night and you're trying to conserve a little bit of energy. You know, there's lots of different factors to consider in terms of what style you play. But I, I am encouraged by the fact that they're going to go with zone and give it a, at least a, a hopefully a fair trial. Oh, I have no doubt they're doing that. I mean, in, in their own zone, they've been playing the zone the entire preseason. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, in terms of the four check, I th- they've probably changed it up a few times. I haven't been paying as close mm-hmm. attention to that. Um, clearly with the four check, if you're down a couple goals, you might start four checking and get a, you know send in two men rather than just one. Um, but uh, yeah, so anyway, I just thought that was interesting from Lawton and a little bit surprising. But it's not unusual. There's lots of people who don't, who take a strong, have taken a strong, you know, and talked to some fans who don't like the zone at all. You know, just the idea of it, the very thought of it. But, um, so I I find that interesting just because last year against Vegas was such a crap show in their own end. I mean, they couldn't hold a lead. They couldn't prevent goals when they needed to. And again, it was that randomness, you know, that that Vegas was capitalizing on. Throw the puck at the net and you, you, you just know there's going to be a certain percentage of the time where the forwards aren't going to cover for the defenseman and you're going to get to that. There's going to be loose pucks sitting there and you're going to get to them before the Oilers forwards do. You'll beat them to the puck and the defenseman won't be in position and you're going to score some goals. And that was Vegas' strategy and it just worked to a T. So, um, yeah. Um, any final thoughts, Bruce? Anything, any other thing you'd like to add? Uh I'm really anxious for the regular season to get going, David. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. This is seven of these games. The, the one encouraging thing, I mean, they started playing the zone, and right away it was like 2-1, uh, shot out in Winnipeg, 2-1, 2-1. These were their first four games. Uh, then they got two in Vancouver, and in Seattle they had like one goal and six shots halfway through the game, you know, through the end of the second period. Now, all of a sudden, the last four periods, 10 goals. And I was wondering, is this going to completely snuff our own offense? So I don't like it. And I didn't think it would, but it, I was waiting for an outburst, and now uh, we've had a bit of one against the Abbotsford Flames, so there's some encouragement to be taken <laughs> from that. Well, with the zone, you do play more in your own end, right? Like there is a little mm-hmm. bit less aggression in your own end, and they're gonna, they're, the other team's gonna hold the puck a bit longer. Mm-hmm. But you know, Vegas scored quite a few goals against the Oilers, and they were playing the zone. So yeah. maybe you're counting the other team to be stumbling around. Uh, they did create covering the what, front of the net. Three breakaways tonight. Oilers did. Slay all the Oilers, yeah. Yeah, by from their own zone, by well, winning, Dylan, winning the puck and then bang. Just one final thought for me, Dylan mm-hmm. Holloway sure has looked good, Bruce. I mean, people yes. have been marking on it. We're not the first here, but um, this is what you, I would have hoped um, the kind of player that Dylan Holloway could be. Just a really uh, fast and effective attacking winger. And um, kind of in the Brandon Sod mode, I guess, um, when, when, when Sod was with the, you know, up and down the wing, aggressive and fast mm-hmm. and effective. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I think he can, can be that kind of player for the Oilers. I think he's got th- those attributes and we're certainly seeing it in the preseason. Um, he's a, he's got, he's got a good skill set. Yeah. I kind of, I well, closer to home in the Warren Fogle mode and Warren Fogle's yeah. a good player. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I, I, I like him. He's a solid third line up and down player who, uh, Holds his own on the, you know, on the, and in, in, in the flow of play, and on, he's lacking on the finishing. And so far, so is Holloway. And I'd really like to see signs of, you know, him uh, taking a step there and starting to finish some plays a little bit. Almost. He sure gets the chance. Oh yeah, sure does get the chances, and just that last touch sometimes lets him down. And so, but he's also, you know, he's still a pretty young player and uh, lots of room to grow. And he's, some of it, he's, he's just got to learn to, he's got to learn what Glenn Anderson learned, slow down around the net, you know, just be, don't panic when you're trying to score, just get that steely resolve, you know, be willing to hold that puck, that extra half second to change your shooting angle or, or, um, 
you know, make make the play you want to play, want to make, as opposed to trying to make everything happen real fast. And some guys get it, and some don't, and some take a while to get it. And I'm hoping he's one of those. Well, that it's a nice comparison, Glenn Anderson. Um, what a hockey player, Glenn Anderson uh, he, was. He, he learned how to score goals in basically his first two years here. And uh, when he was in, you know, De- Denver University and Team Canada, even in the 1979-80 season, he was one who was just buzzsaw out there, creating all kinds of chances, but not finishing very many of them. In the at least in the quite a few games that I saw, and all of a sudden with the Oilers, he started to learn to just be that little bit of patient around the net and uh, and uh, take the puck wide and shoot it high as opposed to trying to slide it through the goalie the minute you've made your deke, and just you know different ways of doing it and. Uh, he obviously excelled at it and learned it well. And I'm just, he's not a great comp for Dylan Holloway, but I'm no, hoping that Dylan no. Holloway can learn some of those things in a similar fashion. Uh, just, you know, experience and repetition. Well, uh, I remember the first time I saw Glenn Anderson play for mm-hmm. the Canadian Olympic team. He mm-hmm. was absolutely electric. Mm-hmm. From the first time I saw him play, mm-hmm. he was just unbelievable rushing that puck. Mm-hmm. And he remained so for more than a decade in the NHL. Did he score 498 goals? He Bruce? scored 498 goals, David. I saw him play with uh, Denver U at uh, Claire, what's now Claire Drake Arena against Claire Drake's oh, yeah. team, the Golden Bears, in 78-79. And I went to – Ken Barry was on that team who was on the orders negotiation list, and I was watching Barry, and I kept saying, well, Barry's pretty good, but who the hell's number nine? He's fantastic. <laughs> And yeah. then, uh, so I knew his name when the Oilers drafted him that summer. I just went, yes, what a nice pick. <laughs> and I had no idea he was going to be a Hall of Famer. I just thought, that's a real good player that they just got in the fourth round. And then the next year when the Oilers did have him drafted, but he played the whole season with Claire Drake on Canada's Olympic team, with Randy Gregg, with, you know, a pretty good set of players. But he was fundamentally, I think, the best and certainly the most explosive offensive player on that team. But he yeah. had he had trouble finishing, and I, I again saw them play uh, an exhibition game against uh, uh, Billy Moore's team now University of Alberta Golden Bears that Billy stepped up into into Claire's old job, and that was a great game. The Golden Bears beat the uh, team Canada, and a lot there was like five ex Golden Bears playing for Team Canada guys mm-hmm. like like Greg and and uh, Dave Heinmarch and. And others that, uh, 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 Kevin Primo, that had uh, stepped away from university hockey, which they were still eligible for, to play for Team Canada. And the Golden Bears were still good enough to win the national championship for the third year in a row. And it was an epic battle, but Glenn Anderson was the apple of my eye that night. And I was just thrilled by how how he dominated play. And I just thought, how can he not score more? And so he figured that part out. Yeah, Canadian national team, 79, 80 mm. statistics unavailable. Oh, really? Yeah, That's it's on Hockey DB. Yeah. 30 yeah. goals in his first season with the Oilers. He developed an outside wrist shot, which was became pretty hard and effective, as I recall, along mm-hmm. with, you know, his very clever play around the net, you know, his famous play with Messier, uh, where one of them would skate behind the net with the puck and then lay it off, drop, drop pass to the guy coming in just behind him, and that guy would put it in the net. Such a fantastic attacking play. Elite prospects had him as playing 47 games for that team, 20 goals and 21 assists. There you and go. also playing six games in the Olympics with two goals and two assists. And I'm just clicking on the team now and seeing if the <clears throat> thing would come up. And uh, yeah, it was number two in scoring behind Kevin Maxwell, who scored yeah. 82 points, twice as many. And did go on to be an NHL player, but nowhere near the impact player that Glenn Anderson became. I remember the, uh, yeah, lobbying. There was some lobbying on certain people to get him in the Hockey Hall of Fame. It took a little longer than I should have taken, in my opinion, for such an absolutely spectacular playoff performer and Team Canada performer as Glenn Anderson. But he's in the Hockey Hall of Fame, so Mm, all is well that ends well. With six Stanley Cup rings. All right, Bruce. 
Six. That's pretty good, isn't it? Six. Five, Five at Edmonton, Edmonton. One with New York. Yeah. And first three draft picks in Edmonton Oilers history in the NHL: Kevin Lowe, Mark Messier, Glenn Anderson. All with and six. They're all with six. And since 1979, the only guys with six are those three and Brian Trotche. First three wow. picks in franchise history all won six cups and all went to the Hockey Hall of Fame. How's that for a draft? That is a good draft. <laughs> Bruce, let's leave it there. Thanks for talking tonight. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. <laughs>